Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to the Megan Kelly Show. The sun never goes down in Cool Town. <laughs> I had my LASIK surgery yesterday, and for those of you who are who are uh, just listening, uh, I've got my sunglasses on because two th- things. Number one, first of all, it went great, and I'm going to have more on it for you in just a bit. But number one, um, I have, I mean, like very bloodshot eyes, like very, very bloodshot eyes, like patches of blood. It's not quite Joe Biden debate level bloodiness but yeah it's not attractive and number two um i'm not allowed to wear any eye makeup at all until tuesday and there's really no reason to subject you people to that so i'm wearing (laughs) wearing um makeup on the rest of my face and sunglasses and you know what it's working for me i i see why comfortably smug does this i think i might be glomming onto his game um at the end of the show we're going to be joined by dr robert maloney he's a very very famous lasik doctor eye doctor he does cataracts he does everything he wasn't the guy who did my procedure, but he did do all of the Kardashians. And um, he's one of the guys who helped like get this thing going back in the 90s when nobody would do it. So I'll give you the full report of how it went. And um, he'll walk you through, you know, how it would go for you and what the concerns might be and so on. But so far, so great. Okay, before we get to Dr. Maloney, two of my favorite people. One I know very well. One I'm looking forward to meeting for the first time. Um, In a second, we're going to be joined by Dan Wooten, uh, our friend across the pond. But before we get to him, uh, well, after we get to him, I want to tell you that we're going to be joined by poet Joseph Massey, a.k.a. Paul. To me, remember, <laughs> my, my audience, I love him on Twitter, and he sent me a nice note, and I responded, and yeah, I'll explain in a minute. Um, anyway, before we get to poet Joseph Massey, the first poet I think I've ever interviewed. I don't, do you remember me ever, ever interviewing a poet, Abs? No, I, don't I don't think so, but I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited for you to meet him, and you must, must, must follow him on Twitter if you want to make your life better. Um, but. We're going to begin across the pond with multiple scandals involving the royal family. Prince Andrew is in hot water again. There was like two minutes he was out of hot water. And now a new Netflix documentary about a notorious British pedophile and his association with Prince Charles. And there's always something going on with Harry and Meghan. My God, you know, the little barf emoji like that. I, that's what I kind of see now whenever I re- read their names. Um, we're going to cover it all now with my pal ba- Dan Wooden. He's host of GB News' Dan Wooden Tonight, and he's a Daily Mail columnist, and he's an all-around great guy. Hey, Dan, how's it going? Megan, I am great, but firstly, I have to say, <laughs> wow, you pull off the sunglasses. And boy, oh boy, I didn't even think you would be here today. I certainly didn't think you would be on camera. So my respect for you as Wonder Woman just grows because it's pretty it's pretty big surgery, isn't it? Really? It's Thank not you. nice anyway, what they do. Well, arrive. it's certainly I'm not. It's not flattering cosmetically in day one. I can tell you that <laughs> I showed my team my eyes without the sunglasses on. They were like, we've seen enough. We're good. You can put those back on. <laughs> Well, I'm okay. super impressed that you're at work. Thank you, sir. I actually feel 100% fine. Like physically, I'm I'm totally normal, uh, as normal as I'm ever going to get anyway. Um, okay, so let's let's kick it off with Prince Andrew. So something nice happened to Prince Andrew where the Queen selected him to be with her. And I know it was sort of controversial. He was going to escort her to, was it at Prince Philip's uh, memorial? And then he screwed it up by diverting press uh, to his misuse of his royal title. Explain what happened. This is absolutely fascinating because what it shows, Megan, is that the Queen at 95 years old and certainly in the twilight years of her reign, I mean, I'm known for saying I want the Queen to go on for decades and I hope she can. But very sadly, Megan, this appearance at the memorial service for Prince Philip could even be one of the last times we ever see her in public. And for the British people, and I think folk all around the world, that is hugely significant. We don't know life without the Queen at these national events. So it was a big moment for the Queen. We knew it was going to be one of her final appearances. She is struggling to walk. So she was brought in through a special entrance at Westminster Abbey. The eyes of the entire country were on her and guess who she chose to escort her to her seat 
Mm-hmm. Prince Andrew, the man who all of the courtiers in the royal family, who all of the other senior members of the royal family, including Prince Charles and Prince William, they want him out the way. They want Prince Andrew never to be seen again in public. And I've been investigating this a lot over the past few weeks, Megan, because you know I do cover the royals on, on top of what I do at G- GB News. And I write about them a lot for the Mail Online and DailyMail.com. And this was the Queen making a big public statement that she believes her son that even though he settled the lawsuit with Virginia Dufre, she doesn't believe the allegations against him. She wants the world to give him a second chance. And this is one of the first times, Megan, in her entire reign, and this is why I find it so historically significant, where the Queen has put family ahead of Commonwealth and country. Because you remember, of course, uh, she denied her sister, Princess Margaret, the opportunity to marry uh, the man who she loved because he was a divorcee. And so I thought this was such a significant moment. And what was particularly fascinating about it is the Queen ignored Prince Charles and Prince William, who did not want Prince Andrew put on centre stage at such a significant event. You've said it before. They covered it in The Crown. He's her favourite. I mean, he's her favorite. She's not afraid for people to know that. So, right, she doesn't believe Virginia Dufre. Neither do a lot of people. I mean, you know, we've talked about this before. Just because Virginia Dufre was definitely a victim of Jeffrey Epstein's does not mean she was Prince Andrew's victim of anything. And she's made allegations against other men, including Alan Dershowitz, that I don't believe for one second. Her stories have been inconsistent very often. So I don't know whether Prince Andrew did what she claims or not, but he's been punished for a colossal lapse in judgment in going back to Jeffrey Epstein as a friend and and staying with him in his New York mansion after the guy pleaded guilty to solicitation of you know, pr- prostitutions, uh, pr- prostitutes who were understood to be very young. Uh, so anyway, like the, any royal, the dumbest royals got to know you're not supposed to do that. And that's really what led to his public shaming. I know, and I think that's what's unforgivable, Megan, actually, in the eyes of the British public. Although I will tell you, there is a growing group of people, especially folk like me, who are very much against cancel culture and believe that you should be found uh, guilty before you lose your career, who say, hang on a moment, uh, what's Prince Andrew actually done? And of course, he's got lots of friends behind the scenes, including Lady Victoria Harvey, uh, who was very close to Prince Andrew in the years where he knew Virginia Dufre, who's working hard behind the scenes. And I had Lady Victoria on my show, actually, and she is convinced that she will be able to clear Prince Andrew. Now, personally, Megan, I don't take that position on this because I think Prince Andrew had multiple opportunities to clear his name. He could have done it in the civil court case, uh, which he said he would do. He could have done it by traveling to New York to... uh, assist the FBI in their investigations. He refused to do that. And of course, remember that cringeworthy but very famous car crash interview with the BBC Mm -hmm. and Prince Andrew, probably actually the biggest royal car crash interview in history where he said he didn't regret his friendship with Epstein. And he said it couldn't have been him that Virginia Giuffre was describing because he doesn't sweat. And she <laughs> said he was sweaty. I mean, he was r- ridiculous about it. So he behaved like a buffoon. Yeah. But I, you know, I might, I might be leaning more in your friend's camp because I just think like the, the proof isn't there. I want due process. I want due process for guys, even if they're royals accused. There's no question he behaved badly and he made stupid decisions, but that's a world away from you knowingly sex trafficked a 17 year old for, you know, self pleasure. My God, that's a world away from that. So I may, I guess I'm with the queen. I don't, I'm not sure I believe these uh, allegations against him. And, and to, Try and explain the situation from Prince Andrew's side, even though I will repeat, I think he's acted appallingly at certain points throughout this whole scandal. But from his point of view, he was almost pushed into a corner in terms of having to settle with Dufre because all of the drumbeat from people behind the scenes, the men in grey suits, as they've described at, at Buckingham Palace, was that... You cannot overshadow your mum's platinum jubilee by pressing ahead with this civil court case. So the idea was he had to settle to save the Queen all of this embarrassment in what is a very big year for her. Okay, but then 
because he is sort of the buffoon of the family. He's he's a little Fredo-ish. Um, he he has his moment with the queen. She's trying to rehabilitate him. That's nice. That you know, a mother's love knows no bounds. And then there's some other moment. I don't know what I don't know what he was posting for on on his ex wife's Instagram, Fergie's Instagram. He takes over the the pen and decides to post all about his service in the military to commemorate this day. And uh, what does he do? Because he screwed it up again and he gained headlines for the wrong reasons. Yeah, it's the 40th anniversary of the Falklands War, which is, of course, a major event in British history. No one expected Margaret Thatcher's invasion. uh, Sorry, Margaret Thatcher's defense of the Falklands after the Argentinian invasion to be successful. And it was. And that was the time that Prince Andrew was a national hero because he fought in the Falklands. And as you say, Fergie, who... (laughs) let's be honest, has gotten to so many scrapes over the years and certainly is not the person that you would want to turn to, Megan, if you were seeking a crisis PR advice. (laughs) But really, she's the only person who has publicly stood by Andrew. And to all intents and purposes, Megan, they are in a relationship. I'm not saying it's a sexual relationship, but they live together. They are each other's rock. And A lot of people believe that at some point they will actually uh, formally remarry. Mm. And she posted these words uh, from Prince Andrew reflecting on his service in the Falklands. And actually, again, without wanting to defend Prince Andrew, I found the words quite powerful. He was talking about the Falklands in the context of the conflict in Ukraine at the moment and talking about how we should avoid war at all costs. Slight problem, though, he signed off the message, His Royal Highness, the Duke of York. He used the HRH title. And again, if you're into the British royal family, that's a big no-no for Prince Andrew because he's not meant to be a working royal. So it summed up uh, what I've been saying for a good couple of years, Megan. Prince Andrew doesn't believe he's going to retire uh, in disgrace from the public spotlight. He's going to spend the rest of his life, however long he has left on earth, trying to cleanse his reputation. And that poses a really big issue for Prince Charles and Prince William, who are trying to modernize the royal family. And having Epstein's BFF hanging around in Prince Andrew doesn't make that easy for them. Mm. And yet uh, Andrew gets a gets a card to use against Prince Charles, just as if, you know, from the heavens, Netflix drops this documentary about this apparently very, very famous British guy. He's dead now. Um, and he was accused of pedophilia during the course of his life, I guess, or some sort of child uh, molestation or inappropriate behavior with kids. But now it's coming out. He was 84 when he died. Now it's coming out. Um, it's much, much worse than we knew. And he was a very close confidant and friend of Charles. I should say no one's suggesting that Charles knew that this guy was hurting children during the course of their friendship. But who is this guy and how did he get so close to so many royals and other muckety mucks in in Great Britain over the years? So Jimmy Savile, Megan, is one of the most famous figures in the UK. While he was alive, he was the most popular TV presenter in Britain. He was attracting 20 million viewers for his shows on the BBC. And he was friends with Charles and Diana. He was friends with Margaret Thatcher. Problem is, Megan, he was also Britain's most notorious paedophile and necrophiliac. And oh, whoa. it was known over the course of his life that he abused young girls. And what ended up happening was, I think, one of the most shameful establishment cover-ups in British history. The BBC, the organization that is meant to be the public broadcaster of this country, covered up Savile's behavior. They knew and they covered it up. And even after his death, Megan, when one of the news programs at the BBC Newsnight wanted to broadcast a tell-all investigation about Savile's uh, paedophilia, they were banned from doing so by what? BBC management. Now, the issue is the first person who offered a full and wholesome tribute to Jimmy Savile following his death was Prince Charles. And this Netflix documentary couldn't come at a worse time for Charles and the entire uh, British royal family, which has been rocked by a series of scandals, of course. And clearly there is an argument for Prince Andrew to make, hang on a moment, big bro. 
Mm. Yes, I was pals with Epstein, but you were close pals with Jimmy Saffle, who was widely known behind the scenes to be a dodgy pedo. And the notes between Saville and Prince Charles, which have been included as part of this Netflix documentary, show just how close their relationship was, Megan. Saville was actually offering lots of communications and PR advice to the royal family, including advice that was shown to Prince Philip and the Queen. He also offered, uh, sorry, Prince Charles also asked him to provide PR advice to Fergie, the Duchess of York, who was involved in all of her own scandals at the time. So look, I'm not saying for a single second that Prince Charles was aware of Jimmy Savile's behaviour. And remember, lots of other people were sucked in, including Margaret Thatcher, the very well-respected first British female prime minister. So maybe we should give Prince Charles a pass on exactly what he knew about Savile, but you can understand why it's particularly uncomfortable given what's just gone on with Prince Andrew. Well, was there, you know, you say that there, a lot of people knew he was a dodgy pedo. (laughs) Um, When did they know, right? So that's relevant. Did did Charles, in the way that Andrew did with Epstein, continue the friendship, friendship after it was known this guy was likely hurting kids? Well, look, the BBC knew as early as 1973, Megan, that Jimmy Savile took underage girls back to his apartment following filming of Top of the Pops, which was a really big music chart show in the UK, quite an iconic show where all of the big pop acts would perform every week. Now, Savile's argument at the time was that, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm taking the young girls back to my apartment, but nothing sexual's going on. And obviously the culture was incredibly different uh, back then. And that argument was accepted and BBC bosses turned a blind eye. Of course, what we don't know is how aware Prince Charles was. But look, there were various newspaper reports uh, throughout Savile's life about uh, some of his dodgy practices. But again, uh, the British libel system makes it incredibly difficult for British newspapers to publish those sorts of allegations without hard and fast proof. And Savile Mm. would boast while he was alive that, oh, well, every time the newspapers publish one of these exposés, it's great because I just get thousands more pounds when I take them to court. So at the very least, it's hard to believe that Prince Charles hadn't heard that he was a dodgy character. Mm. The full extent of his reign of terror and his shocking abuse of children uh, didn't fully emerge publicly, though, until well after his death. Here's just a bit from the Netflix trailer. This is Soundbite 2 on Jimmy Savile. He knew everybody. Can I thank you for everything you do, for every good cause? (coughs) How on earth do you raise 10 million pounds in three years? With Jim, you accepted things as normal, but it was abnormal. (laughs) That is supposed to be me. What did I ever do to you that you would draw that picture of me? He's very intuitive. You do a terrific job, Jimmy. No, that's all front. That's all lies. <laughs> he was making the screen in front of him. It's like you couldn't see through it. He knew fame and power gave him every door. I am a voluntary helper. Sometimes, when nobody's looking, I help the lasses. It turns out everywhere he'd been, there'd been abuse. Oh, my gosh. And you mentioned, just in passing, necrophilia? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it was well known that he would maintain these relationships, Megan, with hospitals and children's hospitals so that he had access to dead bodies. So, you know, this, I I mean, this is the worst story of celebrity abuse i think that exists and i can completely understand why netflix has decided this is a big story in britain but no one outside of the uk has even heard of this bloke plus there's a royal connection so let's turn it into a big series but at the same time megan there are questions being asked about netflix as well and i wrote a column uh for the Daily Mail about this yesterday, because 
Very interesting, isn't it? Intriguing, you might say, that from the moment that Netflix signed their big multi-million dollar deal with Prince Harry and Meghan, there's been a slew of negative Ooh. programs about the royal family. And they seem to be targeting Harry and Meghan's relatives. Oh, that's so interesting. And soon to be followed by a Spotify podcast audio series uh, along the same lines, I'm sure, since that's the other entity with whom they have a deal. Um, Okay, now wait, before we, I'm going to take a break in a second, but I do want to ask you uh, on the subject of Harry. So we started it off by talking about Prince Philip's memorial service. That was Prince Harry's grandfather, that, the Queen's husband. That's his grandpa. And he refused to go yeah. home to England to say goodbye. He didn't show up. And to me, it's like, once again, his reason is incredibly flimsy, pathetic, and all about himself. Will you tell us what he said? I mean, Megan, I just have to be honest now. Prince Harry is a complete and utter scumbag. He has spent years saying how much he cares for the Queen and how much respect he has for the Queen. This might have been his last opportunity to see the Queen. This memorial service meant so much to the Queen, Megan, because you might remember those horrifying pictures over the course of COVID lockdowns in the UK, when the Queen sat alone at Prince Philip's funeral uh, without a soul nearby her because of the ridiculous and actually quite inhumane government restrictions when it came to funerals. So this was the opportunity for the Queen to give Prince Philip the funeral that he had wanted. Her entire family was there. There were only two people missing, Harry and Meghan. And the reason they weren't there, Meghan, is because of a pathetic and petulant row with the British government over who gives Prince Harry security when he comes back to the UK. Because he wants, Meghan, even though he's no longer a working royal and he's in Hollywood making tens of millions of dollars, he wants to still be treated as if he's a working royal. And he wants the British government to provide security for him. Quite rightly, in my opinion, the British government is saying, you are now a private uh, private citizen. That is the decision that you made. So you have to provide and pay for your own security because the Metropolitan Police are not security guards for hire. And if we make that arrangement for you, we're soon going to have Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg or whatever celebrity chooses to arrive in the country asking for privately paid for metropolitan police security. But for me, it actually doesn't matter what the reason is. He let down the queen. And I think if he doesn't get to see her again, we know she is 95, she is Aileen, he should he should never forgive himself for a decision mm-hmm. like that. And I think it just shows how destroyed his relationship is now uh, with the royal family. Of course, Meghan uh, plays a big part in that, in my opinion. And do you think, Dan, with the British people too? I mean, I feel like the British people, they must have been horrified by that decision. He's got tens of millions of dollars pouring into him from the two companies we just mentioned. And he's not wanting for funds to begin with, thanks to Prince Charles and the Queen. So he can't hire a bodyguard to go over them. Like, what does George Clooney do? He doesn't get the, the royal guard. He gets a private bodyguard to walk around and make sure he stays safe. And that's what Prince Harry could have done. Or... Well, I'll play the soundbite. This this is Prince Philip's former royal uh, personal protection officer. You tell me, but it sounds like being, I mean, shockingly candid for somebody in that role on his thoughts about Harry's decision. Listen to Richard Griffin. Weren't people talking about that? Yes, they were. Mm. What were they saying? Certainly around where I was, they thought he should have been here. You know, and all this nonsense about um, he couldn't get protection, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that was a pathetic excuse. He should have been here to honour his grandfather. There is certainly a great deal of security here today, isn't there? So there wouldn't have been any question about that. At, at the end of the day, if he was that worried about security, he could have stuck with his brother and his father, who've got wonderful security, and he'd been more than, more than safe. Fair point. 
Oh, absolutely. And Megan, do you actually know what this is about? It's about the fact that when he came over in July for the unveiling of the statue of Princess Diana, we ha- where he had a very awkward meeting with his brother, Prince William, in public, because the relationship between them is, uh, for the moment at least, more than a little icy, let's just say, virgin on toxic. Uh, basically, some photographers followed him in a car uh, when he left the service. Uh, there was no security scare. There was no issue with the photographers following him. And by the way, Megan, if he drove through Hollywood, he would be trailed by photographers too. That is part of his life. And of course, since the death of his mother, there is so much regulation in Britain about where photographers can can go, about how they can behave. So in my view, Prince Harry has been looking for a reason to avoid the UK, looking for a reason to create drama uh, with the British government. But I just think it makes his decision to name his daughter after Queen Elizabeth II, uh, using her nickname Lilibet, feel particularly hollow, given that the Queen hasn't met this young girl. She hasn't even met her namesake. Wow. I hadn't considered that. So what what about the British people? How are they feeling, do you think, about these two? Oh, they've lost patience completely. Their popularity is at an all-time low. It's particularly shocking for Prince Harry, who at one point was more popular in public opinion surveys, Meghan, than the Queen or Prince William or Kate. He was the most popular member of the royal family. And now, aside from Fergie and uh, Prince Andrew and Prince Andrew's daughters, he's one of the least popular. Mm. Who's your favourite? Are you allowed to say? I know you cover them. Who's your fave? Of course, the Queen. Of course, the Queen. (laughs) And I think she has acted impeccably throughout her entire reign. And at the moment, Megan, it it actually makes for people like me, and yes, we do cover her and we have to cover the royal family, I believe, critically through a critical lens and uh, treat them as public officials. But when you see the Queen struggling to stand up, struggling to walk, but being so stoic because she knows that she has to be seen to look regal. She doesn't want to be in a wheelchair. She doesn't want the public to see her fade away in the same way that they saw her mother, the Queen Mother, and her sister, Princess Margaret, fade away in public. It just gives you goosebumps. And as she stood in that memorial service at Westminster Abbey for Prince Philip and the congregation sang God Save the Queen, there was a particularly emotional moment because I think a lot of people in the room felt this might be one of the last times we get to do this for the Queen. And she stood and there were no issues. And uh, I I just think it says a lot about the stoicism of the generation that we're so tragically losing, who lived through World War II, Mm -hmm. who know what it's like to be in a house as bombs rain down on London, Hitler's bombs. And that's my grandparents' generation. And for me, I've lost all of my grandparents. And the Queen is almost like that last remaining connection to those wonderful people. They are the greatest generation. And even though I think we know it's coming uh, because Mm. the Queen's health is deteriorating, uh, Britain certainly isn't ready for life without her. And a new poll this week, Megan, showed that less than half the British people are comfortable with the idea of Prince Charles becoming king. So there are choppy waters ahead for the royal family, that is for sure. You know, the thing is, you look at her and you think selflessness. That's what I think when I look at her. She just, her whole life and all the bios about her, documentaries about her, show that, that she puts service above herself and others for years. And it, boy, it, it's tough to find that. I mean, I think Prince William's living up to that more and more. Princess Kate, they, I think 
more and more people over here are falling in love with them because you don't hear about too much drama. They're not constantly trying to make it the news cycle about themselves, unlike his little brother and his American yeah. wife. And um, they're the opposite. Harry and Meghan are the opposite. They, while they want, they want to be seen the same as these selfless, I don't want press. I don't, I don't need it. This is perfect. My sunglasses right now are perfect for this. No cameras, no, no lights, no, no press. Of course, they're like, but I'll be at the Beverly Hills Hilton at 2 p.m. on Sunday if you want to get me in my gray limo, right? Like, that's what that's who they are. And people know it. They may not know all the ins and outs of how they manipulate, but you just know it on a gut level because if you are a manipulator, it comes through. Their latest manipulation is where I'm going to pick it up with Dan right after this quick break. More with Dan Wooden in one second. Do you have an account with Coinbase or are you thinking about opening one? Do you own any Bitcoin or Ethereum or other cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency may represent the future of money. It is one of the most exciting investment opportunities to come around in a long, long time. But what about taxes, right? You worry about how you're going to work that out. It's already complicated enough filing your taxes. We're all dealing with that right now. Here's the solution. You can get into investing in crypto and do it in a tax advantage retirement account. Alto's Crypto IRA is the easy way to get crypto into an IRA. You can trade all you want without the tax headache. Create an account in just a few minutes, invest with as little as 10 bucks, no setup charges, and secure trading 24-7 through Alto's integration with Coinbase. 80 plus coins are available, including Bitcoin, Ethereum, and more, and industry-leading security, the advanced encryption standard, for wallets and private keys. You ready to take your investments to the next level? This is the way to do it. Diversify like the pros and trade without tax headaches or the threat of one hanging over you. Open an Alto Crypto IRA with as little as $10. Just go to altoira.com slash Megan. That's A-L-T-O, A-L-T-O, I-R-A dot com slash M-E-G-Y-N. AltoIRA.com slash Megan. Start investing in cryptocurrency today, the easy way. Go to AltoIRA.com slash Megan. So, Dan, the th- this pair has decided to unleash their, their messaging. Uh, they're finally going to get going on their Spotify podcast, but I guess it's just Megan, as it turns out. Uh, she couldn't get Harry. So she, it's just going to be her. What a shock. She just wants it to be all of her airtime, although I can relate. <laughs> um, and she has decided that she wants to trademark a word that is 476 years old as hers. Uh, in the broadcast of her new podcast, which I guess is going to hit this summer, the word is archetype, archetype. It's something you would use, for example, you might say, um, you know, in any given, I don't know, um, crime drama, you could have the villain, the hero, the consoler. Those are archetypes that we are sort of familiar with. She wants to use it in the context of women, Dan, because she's a champion for female empowerment. And the statement is that she wants to address the labels and stereotypes that try to hold women back. And then the articles add in our patriarchal society. So she's going to fight the patriarchy after giving up her entire career, her religion, her country, and her family for a guy. You might say, Megan, this is an archetypal Megan Markle move <laughs> because it's just crass, isn't it? it it's crass commercialization that makes no sense. It's like you're making your tens of millions of dollars from Spotify. You don't have to try and own a word. It reminds me, Megan, when Victoria Beckham, you know, the Spice Girl, uh, who's nicknamed Posh Spice, tried to trademark the word Posh, and she was roundly condemned for it because it's ridiculous. I can use the word archetype in whatever context I want to, I'm afraid, Megan. But it just shows you how bad their advice is and how they're surrounded by the sort of ridiculous Hollywood types who think like celebrities. And I feel like Megan's rebrand is just to say, I'm a victim. And she's about as far from a victim as you could possibly get. 
Mm -hmm. I think it's bad because to me, all right, I I have a saying and I say to my kids all the time, it's about the people who brag uh, about how much money they have or how smart they are or whatever it is. Um, The seven foot center doesn't tell you how tall he is. There's a reason for that. He doesn't have to. And they're trying to use like the fancy word to make her sound smart, like she knows something. The regular people here in America, most of them are like, arch type, archie? Is it an archie type? What is it? Even I was like, what is that? Why don't you ever use that word? I had to look it back up just to remind myself. What is she trying to say? That's a bad sign. You want it to be relatable to as many people as possible, unless your name is Meghan Markle, where you've spent your whole life trying to be less relatable to the common man and woman. You want them to feel that you are above them smarter than they are richer than they are and now at the same time more of a victim than they are and i wonder dan whether there's any appetite from people here or in great britain to listen to this woman talk about how hard it is to be female absolutely not and what i found so hilarious megan was when uh, the other Megan, the Megan we don't like, who spells her name funny, unlike you, uh, <laughs> said, oh, goodness me, maybe I'm going to have to leave Spotify unless they sack Joe Rogan. Yes. And obviously Spotify said, uh, hang on a moment. Take <laughs> Joe care. Joe Rogan ain't going anywhere. And Cheerio. so Megan very quickly said, oh, oh, uh, well, in that case, okay, I'm okay with it. Because... <laughs> Look, they, they need the moolah. They need the big bucks. This is all about the greenback. So they can be as pious and virtue signaling as they want. But actually, when push comes to shove, Megan will share a platform with uh, Joe Rogan because she needs the money. She would share a platform with anyone as long as the check cleared. Who is she kidding? <laughs> there, yeah, the statement from their spokesperson basically said, well... The release of this podcast was originally delayed due to concerns over Spotify's role in spreading misinformation, in particular with respect to COVID. I challenge, I, I want, I'd love to talk to her. N- name three, name three facts. Just any, you know what? Doesn't even have to be misinformation. Tell me three facts about COVID at all. Let's see if you get them right. You know what? I'll give it to you multiple choice. You just, you click the one you think is right, Miss Backup, uh, Howie Mandel, I open the suitcase girl spokes model. She doesn't know anything about anything. She literally knows no, nothing but, but, but about but anything. Megan, Megan, how dare Megan accuse Joe Rogan of misinformation? <laughs> she is the queen of misinformation. You remember the Oprah interview? She even lied about when she got married, for God's yes, sake. The true. interview was literally two hours of misinformation. Uh, so Dan, to me, your misogyny the is showing irony is Megan. Uh, lambasting anyone about misinformation. It's just, it's its laughable now. It's, it's actually it, laughable and we see through it. It's so true. It, I've had s- just about enough of these two. And by the way, just one other small point. They, on their website, the women, the very women who choose not to leave their country and their religion and their husband and everything that they hold dear, abandon their entire family so that they can marry a rich guy in Britain, which was her goal from the beginning, as we've discussed in her yes. other episodes. Okay. She wants to lecture those women about how to empower themselves. So we do not need her advice. But on her website, last week, our friends at the National Women's Law Center released a new report providing a timely snapshot of the continuing multifaceted impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on women and mothers, and then in particular women and mothers who are black and brown and so on, blah, blah, blah. They don't, she doesn't have friends at the National Women's Law Center. She doesn't have friends. She doesn't. Beyonce's not her friend. George Clooney's not her friend. Oprah's not her friend. Gail's not her friend. All of these people showed up at the royal wedding and go on her stupid website and do her little PSAs for the only reason she got married to Harry, because it's access to the royal family and it makes them feel somehow better, smarter, more fabulous. That's all that's going on now, there. And these people, like the use of my friend... Bull, you know, to me, it's so pathetic that like she did abandon all of her friends and all of her family for these people she doesn't know at all. And she's still referring to them as like her friends. She doesn't know. She doesn't know these people and they don't know her. She wasn't friends with Oprah and Gail King, who wanted nothing to do with her when she was a D-list actress on Suits. They became interested when she got it on with Prince Harry. And look, I've actually got to know. Uh, Megan's family really well uh, over the past few years. And uh, 
her father, Thomas, and her sister, Samantha, to me, a good, ordinary Americans. I'm not saying they haven't made a few mistakes, Megan, but anyone who is thrust into that sort of worldwide spotlight are going to make a few mistakes. But I'm a good judge of character, and they are good, honest people. And I just cannot believe that Megan won't drive down that highway to Mexico a couple of hours, and at the very least, just allow her dad to meet her grand, his grandson and granddaughter. I just say shame on you, Megan. Yep. No relationship with the grand grandparents on either side, even though one of them is the Queen of England. Okay. So that tells you something. Um, all right. Moving on. On your nightly show, you cover all sorts of news in the UK. It's fascinating. I watch it on YouTube all the time just to keep up on what's happening across the pond with my pals, my actual pals like you, not the fake pals like she has. <laughs> and um, one of the things you've been covering is you guys are going through the same weird transgender revolution that we are, where it's crossed over to the point of absurdity. But your leader, old Bojo, has handled this a little different than... Um, I'm sorry. All I can think is what Ben Shapiro says. He calls him President Houseplant. It's not nice. But I mean, he just, you know, he's not, we're not sure he's still alive. That's the problem with our president. Um, So as I understand it, uh, Boris Johnson has come out and said, because there was a debate about whether the, uh, the, the, they should ban, quote, conversion therapy for uh, young gay boys and girls and young trans boys and girls. And they came out and said, definitely conversion therapy is totally inappropriate for young gay people. That's absurd. We've known that for decades, but young trans kids, this has been looking more and more like a social contagion and we're not prepared to do that. And Boris Johnson came out and said, I I've got my concerns about all of this too. Um, Here he is talking about transgender issues. This is sound by four. I don't think that it's, it's reasonable for, uh, kids to be deemed so-called gillic competent to take decisions about uh, their their gender or ir- irreversible treatments that they, they may they may uh, have i just don't I, I think there should be parental involvement at the, at the very least that's the first thing second thing i don't think that uh, biological males should be competing in female sporting events and, and you know maybe I'm, maybe that's a controversial thing but it just it just seems to me to be sensible and uh, I also happen to think <clears throat> that um, women should have spaces wh- which are, whether it's in, in, in hospitals or prisons or change rooms or wherever, which are, are dedicated to, to, uh, to women. Ah, revolutionary. So how does that go over with the British public? Where do they stand on these issues? Well, incredibly well. And obviously, very few people, Megan, would listen to what Boris Johnson just said and think it's at all anything other than complete common sense. But to contextualise what's been going on here in the UK the past couple of weeks is that the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer, the bloke who wants to be prime minister and at the moment, Megan, is actually leading Boris Johnson in the polls, has been asked numerous times, what is a woman? And can a woman have a penis? And he has stuttered and he has been completely pathetic and unable to answer the question. Even Boris Johnson's rival for the main job within his own party, his chancellor, Rishi Sunak, was asked to define what a woman is. And he refused to answer the question. So this is a big win. For Boris Johnson electorally, because a new group has just been launched and they've been all over the media, including the front page of the Daily Mail, which is the most read newspaper in the UK. And it's called uh, You Won't Get My Ex Unless You Respect My Sex, because we have the local elections coming up here in May. It sort of plays a similar role as the US midterms. And this group described themselves as the most important feminist movement since the suffragettes. And it's actually very hard to argue against that, Megan, given we're currently living in a world here in the UK where British cycling want a competitor called Emily Bridges to be able to compete against biological female cyclists. When Megan, Emily Bridges was competing as a man just a few weeks ago. So Boris Johnson has tapped into the anger and the frustration going on here about trying to erase women from society. And I I really think we are at that point. 
so few are willing to do it, are actually willing to stand up for, for women and, and allow just the complete takeover of traditionally women's sports, locker rooms, whatever areas. Um, you were not to be left sitting on the sidelines on this one, Dan. You sent out one of your fearless producers onto the streets of Great Britain to figure out what's the, what's the pulse of the populace on this important issue about the penis. And here we have a clip of that. Quick question that Sir Keir Starmer has struggled with in recent days. Can women have penises? Uh, you'll have to ask the Prime Minister first. What does he think, do you know? <laughs> doesn't take into consideration how women feel about it and women's rights. Surely it's a simple answer that women can't have penises? We're just asking if uh, women can have penises. Is it something you'd like to uh, elaborate on? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? No, they can't, can they? Can women have penises? I, I'm not going. Uh, I'm just asking people a simple question whether women have, can have penises. I'm not prepared to answer that because I don't know enough about the subject. <laughs> but thanks very much for asking. You don't know enough about men or, or women's simple biology? Can women have penises? Can women have penises? Sir, Ben from GB News, can women have penises? <laughs> he doesn't know enough about the subject. Remind mm-hmm. me never sleep with him, Dan. <laughs> don't let me sleep with that random They man. are some of our political leaders you know they are cabinet ministers they are party leaders and it is gutless but i think folk like that will be punished at the polls because it's not just women who've had enough megan i mean i speak as a bloke i'm a massive fan of women's sport and i just fundamentally believe Anyone biologically born a man cannot compete in women's sport. I don't buy this thing that there's any gray area or that hormone levels make a difference. We just have to have hard and fast rules on this one. And so it's been very pleasing for me to see Boris Johnson be morally courageous enough to do this. Because interestingly, a little bit of background to this, Megan, his wife, Carrie Johnson, who is certainly... Uh, Let's just say she's on the woke side of things and she's been a bit of a negative influence in terms of Boris Johnson's policy. And she is actually in cahoots uh, with one of the uh, LGBT. That's what we're meant to say now. Right. I mean, I just say gay organization Stonewall, uh, which very much backs the trans lobby on these issues and thinks that trans competitors uh, should be able to compete in, in women's sports. So. Boris Johnson, by making this public statement, let's just say uh, things might have been a little bit difficult when he got home, if you Mm. get what I mean. Carrie Mm. Johnson wouldn't have been happy because that's not the position uh, that she shares. And she's become, uh, for all the wrong reasons, increasingly influential on Boris Johnson's decision making over the past couple of years. Mm. All right. We have about a minute left. What do we think about his chances of re-election? Well, they're looking better now. I mean, I'm sorry if you've if if you've got a leader of the opposition who cannot answer the question, uh, does can a woman have a penis? I mean, I I, I think that's someone who's heading to electoral disaster. We just put one on the Supreme Court. (laughs) I know, I know, I know. It's bad, and and I and I think if you look at what's happened in the Biden administration, actually, there's a there's a great warning, and the British people are very much taking note at what happens when you have woke warriors uh, taking over power. I will say, and Megan, by the way, I'm not one of the people that particularly cares about what's become known as the party gate scandal, you know, whether Boris Johnson was having people over to his house when he'd locked the whole country down, because I just feel like the world has moved on and all the scandal should prove is that we should never have locked down in the first place. It was completely morally wrong to ask people to go through that. But I will just say the police investigation is continuing. So there is still the possibility that Boris Johnson could be fine. But look, I think Boris has provided a great moral leadership over yeah. the Ukraine crisis. Zelensky, obviously one of the most popular politicians in the world in some quarters at the moment. I know there's other people who are very anti-Zelensky, but in a lot of quarters, he's very popular. And of course, he's bigging Boris Johnson up all the time. So no, I think Boris is in a, in a good place at the moment. Dan, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Megan. Keep well. Hope your eyes are okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll be right back. <laughs> Women are at a higher risk of poor sleep quality and sleep deprivation due to hormonal changes. Did you know that? That can disrupt the circadian rhythm, negatively impacting overall health. Oh, joy. (laughs) This can later lead to hot flashes and night sweats and up to 85% of women making sleep seem impossible. 
And even if you put the cell phone down and you turn the lights off, your body still needs one final trigger to let it know, we can sleep now. This trigger is a decrease in temperature, which hacks your primal response and convinces your body it's finally bedtime. You know what to do. And that is where chilly sleep comes to the rescue, whether you're a new mom or you just hate tossing and turning in sweaty sheets. Chilly Sleep makes customizable, climate-controlled sleep solutions that help you improve your entire well-being. As part of an overall scientific study conducted by Wake Forest researchers, Chilly Sleep's cooling bed products were shown to significantly reduce the frequency of night sweats and the frequency of hot flashes. Head on over to chillysleep.com slash mk to learn more and save 30% off the purchase of any new Cube or Uller sleep systems. This offer is available exclusively for Megyn Kelly listeners and only for a limited time. That's chilly, C-H-I-L-I, sleep.com slash MK to take advantage of our exclusive discount and wake up refreshed every day. Welcome back to the Megyn Kelly Show. Joining us now is somebody I've been wanting to meet, poet and writer, who I follow on Twitter and who I urged all of you to follow too, and I continue to do that. His name is Joseph Massey. His work was praised by many, including the New York Times, which wrote, a Massey poem is a revelation, until the cancellation mob came for him. He's written so openly and honestly and in a very raw way about what that did to him and how he survived it and how what his advice is for others to survive it when the cancellation mob comes for them. I've become a true fan and he's here to talk about all of it, along with his new poetry book, which we all have to buy to support him because the mainstream will not promote him. Uh, The book is called Rosary Made of Air. Welcome, Joseph Massey. Great to have you here. It's great to see you, Megan, or kind of see you. You're wearing the shades. Can you see? I can see. I can't. Like, when I'm reading my papers, it's hard only because it, my shades are so tinted. But my eyes are now seeing perfectly. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Yeah. Amen. So um, there's a lot to go over. Now, first of all, should I call you Joseph or Joe or Paul? <laughs> Joseph's fine. Your producer was, I think he was calling me George and he did it twice. <laughs> it runs with the family, Joseph. Even after I corrected him. And then your other producer called my book, Rosemary Made of Air. <laughs> you know what? So I, can't, I, I can't get a break on the Megyn Kelly show. So, but, but you give the breaks out as often as human, humanly possible. I told my audience about this. I know you heard this, but for those who didn't hear this episode, we were doing an episode on time management. And I was saying, I'm not very good at responding to people v- via text message, via email. Abby's over there going, mm-hmm, via DM, doesn't matter. And you were nice enough to reach out to me via DM. I, I follow you on Twitter for very good reason. You're amazing. And, um, and you you sent me a note. So about a month later, I realized I had a note from you, and I responded. And again, your name is Joseph Massey. And I responded as follows. Paul. <laughs> why? I don't know why. I, I am bad at checking DMs and apparently at remembering names that are written right down for me. Uh, but a belated thank you for doing this and for putting beauty into my days. You may be the most thoughtful person on Twitter, which I realize is a low bar, but still. And th- this is the thing that made me fall in love with Joseph Massey. He writes back, <laughs> he writes back, Megan, your note made my night. Thank you. Your work is fearless and an inspiration and always great company. I like the name Paul. You can call me Paul if you want. Normally, I go by Joseph. It's all very Catholic either way. (laughs) (laughs) Love your sense of humor. So thank you for letting me off the hook on that one. All right. So let's go back to how you got into poetry. Because I was just saying I've never interviewed a poet before. What drew you to it? I was very young. I was 12 years old, and I was a very troubled student and i think that was the sixth grade year and they just told me to sit in the auditorium every day don't go to don't go to class i don't know if that was legal i don't know how that happened but that's what i did and during that time i stumbled upon a biography about about jim morrison of all people i didn't even like the doors but was through that book and reading about jim morrison's early life that i discovered uh the french poet um arthur rimbaud and frederick nietzsche 
uh, German philosopher, and then also the Beats, the Beat poets, Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, those poets especially. And, and um, yeah, from that point forward, my life uh, changed. But was it one of those things you knew you had to do it? It was therapeutic for you? Yeah, at the time, it certainly was, because my home life was was rough. You know, uh, my family, the, the adults I, I was surrounded by, you know, they they were they were very busy people working in factories and just trying to survive and you know working in diners and and so language was usually um pretty coarse and um reading these poets uh felt like real rebellion to me um it was a way of reclaiming this language that as far as i had known up to that point was only being used to uh curse at the Eagles game, you know, mm -hmm. or yell at the dog or something. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering and reading more about you personally, because even before the Me Too mob came for you, you you had a tough upbringing. You know, you made reference to it here, but there was abuse of all kinds. You've been very open about it. And it made me start to wonder whether <sighs> I mean, forgive me the indelicacy of it, but whether one can be a happy poet. Does one go into poetry to reflect on one's joys and happiness full time? Or do you think most people are drawn to it, at least initially, to express some form of despair? Well, I think it's both. I, I don't know if, if someone can experience, for lack of a better way of putting it, uh, full, full on joy if they haven't also experienced terrible despair what would they have to compare it to? And um, so that's, that's how I see that. And uh, a lot of my poetry does come out of a, it's more than joy. It's uh it's ecstatic. It's um, there's a mystical kind of edge to some of the things that I do. I mean, I'm constantly yes. in wonder. I'm in wonder of the world around me all the time. It's, I'm never bored. Um, so yeah, but I don't I don't I would not be a poet if it hadn't been for all of the, um, frankly, trauma that I endured. Mm -hmm. Well, this is one of the this is the reason your, your name came up in my earlier conversation, because we were talking about how it's important to put down the iPhone and step away from the screens and just just take a moment to appreciate the beauty in life, this life's small beauties, which of course are also it's, it's great ones. And you help do that in my life. I've been following you for years now and you'll be scrolling through on Twitter and it'll be a mass of toxicity. And then you'll hit a Joseph Massey tweet, which is usually about the, the bullshit nature. Sorry, God, forgive me, Lent. I'm screwing it up again. Um, the, the BS nature of cancel culture and sort of wokeism. Or it'll be an injection of beauty. It'll be it'll be like a link to something you've done. Or the email is what I really recommend, and people can get this. I went and looked today. You can you can join you can follow Joseph Massey Substack for five bucks for month one. You can try it out for one for five dollars, and you see his beautiful poems always accom accompanied by a beautiful photograph, and it's the smallest stuff. And you can find beauty. I, I mean, I've read your poems. I've read your book. Y you you write about you know the scene at Family Dollar. You know, like over the parking lot, like images we've all had, but we don't appreciate them in the in the right way, in the way that you help us to to see them. Yeah, that well, my my modus operandi on Twitter is to disrupt the toxicity. I really love the idea of putting a poem without commentary, just putting the, uh, a screenshot of a poem up on Twitter and imagining somebody scrolling through just the most horrible um, shit. And then they come and they stumble upon the poem. It must be if they spend time to to, to read it, it must be very um, disruptive. But I would hope in a in a very positive way. And um, that's what poetry can do. It reclaims, it rejuvenates language that's been so abused and and used for manipulation. It's been drained of its life through politics the language of politics and the language of war and the language of commerce and um the poem brings language back to a really human place and the purpose of a poem is to communicate and that's something that's lost in the world of screens and yada 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 mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And yet it's not as re- readily available as we'd like. You know, it's it, you don't get poems f- foisted on you the way you get links to books or new podcasts or new digital shows. And that's another thing I love about following you on Twitter and also Dispatches from the Basement, which is what you call the Substack emails uh, and links to your work, because it's it just makes it it's right there it's one click away as opposed to having to go look for it for somebody who doesn't follow poetry like me it's you make it super easy and the poems are easy to connect with i mean you don't have to work that hard it's just beautiful um i'm sure for you there's some labor that goes into it but for the for the reader there's no labor it's just it's just love and connection and a thought or a moment of serenity it's the opposite of what i say like a lot of these websites now are too Mm, cold about our feelings when they post things like about child abuse or like there's a terrible story going on right now about the the killing of this innocent dog in china by their their crazy covid police over there who have zero covid and the video is horrific i mean they just post this like you're just scrolling on twitter and there's this suddenly you're assaulted with the video of of animal torture that's not okay you're the antidote for that you're the antidote for that so i feel like what you're doing is important. I want to give people just a sense. This this just came in my inbox on Monday. All right, this is from Joseph Massey's Dispatches from the Basement. He writes, the poet has two jobs, write and survive. Um, and I, I got a list about my glasses. I can't read. Okay, write and survive. Uh, between the two, some kind of life occurs close to the ground in poverty. And there are seasons. Even as a snow squall uh, pixelates the alley outside my window in the middle of May, Poetry is time chiseled into a shape that makes a sound. Yes, I love that. So this is obviously written before because it's April. But um, I I wanted to ask you about that, the poverty, because you write about you don't have a lot of dough. Um, You should be charging more than five dollars a month, first of all. (laughs) But second of all, is that also part of it? And are there any rich poets? Oh yeah, the rich the rich poets are the tenured professors who are who are ruining poetry, in my opinion, uh, because the MFA poetry world is quite a racket. And uh, I think there are three hundred MFA programs in the country, and pumping out how many thousands of uh, wannabe poets every year. Um, yeah, and so the the big money is in being a, a tenured professor. It's rare to achieve that. But um, and and there are poets with trust funds. I mean, the more that these MFA programs proliferate, uh, the more you see 20 somethings who, you know, have very wealthy parents who never told them that, hey, maybe you're not all that talented. Maybe you should uh, do ceramics and, you know, (laughs) pick something more practical. But um, that, (laughs) that that never happens. So, no, there aren't uh, it, the poets that I've loved in my life. They've dedicated their lives entirely to poetry and there is no real financial reward in that. However, since I was canceled and then had to rebuild my life over the course of two or two and a half years, something like that, you know, I've been able to make some money through the Substack. And the book that I just put out, I published it myself. I've never published my own book before, and I, I won't give the number, but I mean, I've, I've I've made enough in royalties to pay a couple months worth of rent. That's pretty unheard of for any poet. All right, but we have to we have to. That's not good enough. We have to do better. Rosary made of air. Everyone can go to Amazon.com and buy it. It's available on Amazon, and we need it right now. It's like number seventy in certain in a poetry sub. That's not good enough. Let's get it to number one. Please support Joseph, Rosary Made of Air. I never actually ask my audience to go. I say, rec- I recommend it. You should check it out. I never say, please go buy it. I'm saying, please go buy it. We, we have to support artists like you who are putting out good works into the ether, who have been silenced by, you know, this group of moralists who decides if you make mistakes in your life, you are never to be forgiven. No matter how many mea culpas, no matter how much you've shown the world that you see the error of your ways, you, you understand you you may have misstepped, but you're like you're human and you're on the same journey the rest of us are on, e- evaluating past behaviors, learning from them if you're at all evolved, which you are, and trying to do better. So that leads us to 
the the cancellation that you suffered during the Me Too movement. And as I understand it, and I would love to have you back another time and really get into it because the story is way, way more dense and complex than you know we we can do justice to here. But you had a, you had a, a romance with a married woman. She was a poet as well, and it was bad. It went bad. It ended badly. And at it was the always end of it, bad. It was always bad. Okay, so it was always bad. And as I understand it, this is my take on it. You were in a bad place. You contacted the husband on Facebook and told him that you were having an affair with the wife. And the wife decided the things were going to get worse for you <laughs> and started publicly making very derogatory posts about you, having her friends write long anonymous letters about what a terrible man you are. Contact. It's more than that. Contacting everyone with whom you did business in the poetry world. I mean, everyone. And, and encouraging them, urging them to cut ties with you, all of whom did without offering you any chance to defend yourself, your actions, or really even in a lot of circumstances to know what the specific allegations were. No one told me anything about any specific allegations. When you, I, I was working for the University of Pennsylvania, which was... <laughs> I mean, it just felt amazing. I'm, I'm making money doing poetry. I can possibly have a real living at this. And with a ninth grade formal education, it felt like a real coup for me. And um, yeah, the director who was singing my praises only months before at a, a fundraiser that he had me read for, uh, he um, dumped me with a very legalese laden email and said, point blank, I will not discuss any of the allegations against you and i won't discuss any of this with you you're just you're done and um when these kinds of things continuously come at you over the i mean it went on for it's like a year like this really intense um loss of of what i've felt i'd earned um it really starts to screw with your head uh, not knowing what you're being accused of. And later on, I came to find out that the woman I was in the affair with had been accusing me of all kinds of things that were absolutely untrue and would have been easily enough um, disproven if I had been given a chance to defend myself because I never deleted a single email or text message from this lady. And uh, there are so many emails that would exonerate me. Um, and uh, I was never given that opportunity, which is why I eventually wrote the essay for Quillette, mm -hmm. which was my opportunity to give my side of the story. But that was published in June of 2019. Yep. The cancellation happened January 2018. It took that much time to kind of gather my marbles. And and the audience should know you're very hoping in that in that piece i mean you you lay it out very very clearly that you've made mistakes you've done bad things and you're sorry for them and so it's not like you're trying to say nothing i've been perfect man and i treated all these women perfectly it's it's i'll own what i did you know some some verbal mistreatment and you know some bad incidents with me but i'm not going to own what i didn't do and that's the problem with these like blanket allegations where people just want you canceled for allegations without evidence. And this is what I'm referring to in particular. So I guess this woman with whom you had the affair had an anonymous a friend pen this anonymous letter and send it to all of your business associates. And, it, and she writes in it, this, a quote, anonymous person, I hope you will end relations with Joseph and make a public statement about it, especially in light of the cultural shifts around believing victims. Right back to the you have to believe all women. It's not it's like not enough to have due process. You have, the woman gets the thumb on the scale and then goes on um, to say this is this is how she writes a letter to whom it may concern. I just pulled out some phrases. Far too many people have told me about his behavior. Um, for many people in whisper networks, it is now taken for granted that he's a predator. Well, what? That would never be admitted in a court of law. You would get an objection that was sustained almost immediately upon saying something like this. An alleged encounter the writer had, and so on and so forth. Like, this is not proof. This is, this is an attack that you should be given the opportunity to respond to, and yet everyone in the poetry world 
turn their back on you. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, the, the main allegation in that letter was that I called the letter writer hot at a poetry reading. Right. I know I know who wrote that letter. She's not hot. And I never even met her. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, this was at the height, the peak of Me Too, when after it had kind of started to spiral out of control, you know, the Oz, Aziz Ansari um, situation and mm -hmm. where things really started to become kind of muddy, which was so unfortunate because Me Too was doing a lot of good. I know about your story. That's it's disgusting. Anybody would be treated that way in their workplace. Um, but that energy that, that was behind that movement was taken and uh, taken advantage of by people like this woman I was in the affair with who orchestrated this destruction of my life. Um, mm -hmm. But they failed. They didn't destroy me. It just took some time for me to, to rebuild. Uh, but I have. Now I'm so glad you're in a better place. But you, I think the openness you've shown about the pain being canceled caused is admirable. And I, I'd be lying if I said I didn't also relate to it. Um, I think too often in, in an effort to make these stories empowering, we kind of skip over just how devastating it can get. When you look around, you, I think you had a line in one of your pieces, the life you know is now the life you knew. It's gone. It's True. gone in a second. And you, the, you spend some moments in a tailspin asking yourself, how, what, what just happened? What, you know, and you, the future, you don't know. You have no idea professionally whether you even have a future. And it's devastating. And in your case, led to severe, severe depression and even suicide attempts. Yeah, and extremely debilitating panic attacks almost every day. Um, not the kind of panic attacks where it just, you know, I, you know, I'm just a little uptight or something, but like I'm having a heart attack. I'm, I'm dying, you know, and uh, yeah, that led me to uh, being hospitalized for a, a couple weeks. And um, that was incredibly helpful. Uh, all the nurses there were so wonderful. It was, I thought it would be like one floor over the cuckoo's nest, but it wasn't. And um, it, it really saved me um, at that time. And then also, you know, regaining my uh, footing in a, on a spiritual path. Uh, really helped tremendously. But, you know, Megan, one of the best things about writing that essay for Quillette is that I've heard from countless people, I still hear from them, who've read the essay, who've experienced something or other that I've described in the essay, and they have felt uh, healed by it, or at least seen and heard by what I wrote. And that means the world to me. I'm working on a memoir and the only reason I'm writing this thing is to potentially help other people. I don't enjoy making art out of uh, <laughs> these horrible things that have happened. Um, but I feel like it, it may be necessary. Mm -mm. Yes, I feel that way too. But you talk about how you got on medication. First of all, you, you sought help. You went to a hospital. That was good. You got on medication. You went to Alcoholics Anonymous. You got into meditation and breath work which is so important my sister-in-law diane she loves breath work and can't say enough about it and i know you feel the same you know the deep breathing holding it inside you know and, and then exhaling and just sort of if you can breathe you're alive if you can breathe you're still here if you can breathe you can you can write the poetry you know you can go to the goodness for me, I, that's sort of where I diverged from you because I was like, I'm not sure rejoining the, word, the world of media is goodness. You know, like I had this toxic stew still sitting there saying, come back, come back. And I was like, ew, ew, I don't want it on me. I just got it off of me. <laughs> and then I kind of like you here, you know, found a different way. It was like, oh, my God, wait, what if you could do it without being in the toxic stew? What if you could do the thing you love and that you know you're really good at without being in the toxic stew? That's what you're doing. That's what I'm doing. But I want to say this. Okay, can forgive me because I'm having. Like, I'm just really trying to manage these sunglasses and all that. But you write this, talking about sort of going for walks and and feel companionship with everyone and everything you pass. You say I I know this drives against the grain of the fear and anger boiling within you, but you have to find a way of rechanneling those emotions. Don't let the mob drive you to annihilate yourself. 
If the sun is out, turn your face toward it. If it's raining, let it fall down the back of your neck. Feel yourself present in every given moment. The sense of loss is overwhelming, but now cannot be lost. Now cannot be lost. And if you continue with this practice, grace will find you. Oh my God, that's so beautiful. That's not even a poem, but it makes me feel the same way your poetry does. You do those things. It's reflected in your photography, in your poems, the beauty of the puddle, the beauty of the fence post, the beauty of what's out the window on a spring day. I mean, what's well, well, it like it to wasn't be you now? Just the, it, it wasn't just the meds you know, that helped or the breathing techniques. It was continuing to write poetry and continuing to take photographs and continuing to engage the world as I always ha had. And uh, that is what really, I wouldn't be here without it. And um, yeah, in that essay, I, I stress again and again uh, to continue to, to do what you've always done, find a way to do it if you're able, you know, cause some people who go through this, they're just, they're flat on their back and almost a catatonic state for, you know, they're, they're not a, they're not functional. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a devastating thing. And I, I know about your story and you know, I've, ha I've had a tiny taste of being publicly humiliated or having crappy articles written about me. And, you know, you, you endured quite a bit, but that's one of the reasons why I sent you my fanboy note is because <laughs> you did, you, you came back. This show is terrific. You, it seems like you're, you're truly yourself in this show. Like it's, a, it's fully you. And, um, I love it. It's, it's been, it's been part of my, uh, media healthy diet. Oh, thank you so much. Honestly, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you. And uh, I really, I want people for their own sake. It'd be great to support Joseph, of course, for all the reasons I stated, but for your own sake, follow on Twitter, go so, sign up for the Substack. It's, it's ex inexpensive, even on a yearly basis. I'm going to get one for all of my team before, before the day is out. Abby, would you make a note of that? Um, and just bring a little dose of lovely, of serenity, of thoughtfulness, of peace, of wellness into your life of meaning meaning into your life meaning, thanks to joseph meaning. that's right what a Thank pleasure you, thanks for everything joseph black rifle coffee company is a veteran founded company serving premium coffee to people who love america they develop their explosive roast profiles with the same mission focus learned as military members serving this great country of ours and in 2021 black rifle coffee donated over 100,000 bags of coffee which is 2.1 million cups of coffee, to first responders, law enforcement, and active duty military members. So you know that with every purchase you make, Black Rifle is going to give back and to a group you love. Black Rifle Coffee imports high-quality coffee beans from Colombia and Brazil, and they roast those beans five days a week at their facilities in Manchester, Tennessee, and Salt Lake City, Utah, domestically, which means you get the freshest coffee possible no matter where you live. The best way to enjoy Black Rifle's freedom-filled coffee is with the Black Rifle Coffee Club. I'm a member. When you join the club, your brew of choice is roasted, packaged, and shipped free to your door on your schedule. You never have to worry about, oh my God, family's coming. Do we have coffee? We're out. It's always there. You can buy uh, it, the membership, or just the coffee at blackriflecoffee.com and use the code MK at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. That's blackriflecoffee.com slash MK and use that code MK when you check out, please. Black Rifle Coffee, America's coffee. Welcome back to the Megan Kelly Show. Joining me now is renowned LASIK surgeon, Dr. Robert Maloney. He has helped the stars, I mean, lots of them, including most of the Kardashian family, see clearly for over 25 years. Dr. Maloney, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure, Megan. Happy to be here. All right. So I am 20 hours off of my own LASIK surgery, which I had here in Connecticut yesterday. I want to say it was Dr. Suresh Mandava. 
in Stamford, Connecticut, who did mine. And I love Dr. Mandava. He's wonderful. He's done a ton of these things, and I felt like I was in very good hands. You can relate to that because not only are your credentials impeccable, summa cum laude, Harvard College, medical doctorate from uh, University of California, San Francisco. You were a Rhodes Scholar, went to Oxford, residency in ophthalmology at Johns Hopkins. You were one of the first uh, to get involved with LASIK, even having it on your own eyes back in the dark ages, 1990. Seven. So you're a perfect person to talk about, and Dr. Mandava agreed. Um, let me ask you this. One one day out from LASIK, what should I be expecting? Just so, so, so we can see whether I'm I'm doing okay. Sure. And I'm sure you're, you're in great hands. I'm sure you're doing great. So you should have little red dots on your eye, which is, I suspect, why you've got those uh, sunglasses on. Yes. And you're not supposed to wear makeup typically for a period of a week, which is another reason to put the glasses on. Yep. Uh, you should have a little bit of irritation today. You should have a little bit of fogginess to your vision. I saw you struggling to read momentarily there. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's pretty normal. That fogginess will go away tomorrow. The irritation will go away typically in a day to a week. And then uh, your vision should be incredible. Great. I mean, it was so great today to wake up for the first time ever, in, in my memory anyway, being able to see the alarm clock. Like, not struggling to find my glasses. I know. Like, it's, it's like, incredible. I, I woke up the morning after my LASIK surgery, and for a moment, I thought I'd forgotten to take my contacts out because I was seeing so well. Yes, exactly right. So yes. I want to tell the audience that, uh, first of all, the procedure was, to me, a nothing. I, I mean, he gave me some sort of a happy pill, which he said had Valium. I think he said one of the ingredients was ketamine, which is the stuff you get, like it's a psychedelic or something you get for, if you you know want to take a trip with your psychiatrist and some third ingredient. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep. Yep. It really makes you very relaxed, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. So I was like, I, it's not working. It's not working. And then I stood up and I almost fell over. I'm like, it's working. So I walk in, I lie down on the table and I mean, it was a it was like 10 minutes, 12 minutes tops. The machine came over my right eye and it, it did like, it looked like etching. It looked like, um, I don't know, just lines. And then it went away and then it came back and it did something else. And then the same exact thing on the left side. And then he said, get up, you're done. <laughs> that's, that's, that was it. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? I like to say it's the first procedure of the 20, 23rd century. It just got here really early. So I went in this morning before the show to get tested. And already, even though I'm still a little cloudy, already I'm, I'm at 20 vision without any corrective lenses. I mean, that's a, it's a miracle. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's it's crazy how easy it is. I mean, and it's scary for people because, I, I mean, imagine you felt this way. You're going and going, oh, my God, they're going to laser my eyeball. What's going to happen? Mm-hmm. And then you take the you take the sedative and it really you still feel anxious and you get in there and you're still anxious. And then it's over in 10 minutes. And all of a sudden, wow, that was easy. Yeah. Now, I will confess, I had no nerves about it. I, don't, I just didn't feel nervous about this procedure. Right. Oh. But my oh. husband, who won't even go to the eye doctor for a normal eye exam, I have to lie to him and tell him they got rid of the glaucoma test to get him to go because he doesn't like things coming near <laughs> okay. his eye. He, he, he was like, I'll, I'm going to go with you. I want to be supportive. And then they convinced him to like watch it from outside. Yeah. And the, he yeah. wasn't expecting the close up on the video screen. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, did you get because he was going to video it for my kids, our kids. And I go, did you get it? And he was like, no, I had to sit down. <laughs> we, we occasionally like have people just faint and uh you know when we're doing the surgery and it's it's we try and catch them before they fall but it it, it can be hard to watch it's easy to do it can be hard to watch okay so one of the reasons we always, we always say we always say if you're thinking about lasik have it before you watch it exactly so right. okay it. there you go because one of the reasons that i was not nervous is i did not consult dr google at all yes. about you know possible downsides. I just listened to my doctor on that, and uh, I didn't watch it. So I was like, fine, I don't need to know. It's like I didn't need to watch them do my uh, cesarean section either, right? No, some things are not necessary. They get done, works out okay. But the the terrible like LASIK will kill you. It'll make you blind. Websites. You tell me because my impression is those are people who chose doctors who should not be doing LASIK. Yeah, I mean, the, the safety LASIK's unbelievably good. You know, it, it's clear. I mean, people worry about what will a disaster happen? Will I lose my vision? Um, it's very clear that LASIK is less likely to make you lose your vision than contact lenses. I mean, the, the risk of a contact lens statistic is about one in 3,500 every single year. That doesn't sound like much, but it adds up over time. Wow. And uh, with LASIK, the risk of infection is incredibly low. And so the safety of LASIK is unbelievable. The, the, 
there are websites out there where people have problems. And part of it's a reflection that nothing is perfect. There's always a slight risk to any procedure. But mm-hmm. these stories are generally from 10, 20, 25 years ago, from the early days of LASIK, when doctors were treating people who maybe shouldn't have had LASIK. And uh, yes. our equipment and techniques were old. I mean, it's like airplanes, right? If you're flying a Model T airplane, uh, I mean, a Model T, um, a Wright Brothers airplane, a lot of them crashed. A lot of people died. Nowadays, air travel is much safer than driving a car or walking through the streets of New York, as you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, if you uh, go to one of those big surgical centers that's just like they crank them out, then that's like a volume business. There may be pressure from, you know, corners you don't want pressure from to get a lot of surgeries done. You, you don't want that. You you want to go to an individualized surgeon who's done a, who, do, who does a ton of these and um, who will turn you away if you're not a candidate. Like I have dry eye, which is really the reason I got LASIK. I was, I could still wear my contacts. They actually weren't bothering me, but I know that they're bad for dry eye. They exacerbate dry eye over the long haul. So, you know, my doctor was like, kind of, you should wear your glasses full time or consider LASIK. Um, so, but if you have severe or dry eye, they probably won't do LASIK on you. So I needed an honest doctor, right? To say you are or are not a candidate. Yeah. So, um, did you, were you having trouble wearing your contacts because of the dryness? Not really, but my eyes have definitely gotten drier over the past like four years. You know, if I step out into the wind, they instantly tear. Um, if I read a lot, which I do for work, they get very, very tired pretty quick. And did you have to use lubricating eye drops to keep your eyes moist? I'm on restasis. Yeah, which is just annoying as you're, you're always putting something in your eye. Contacts suck all the moisture out of your eyes. So, if you have mild dry eyes, contacts are hard to wear. And we have very good studies that show that dry eyes on average improves after LASIK because you get the contacts out and your eyes are now natural and healthy. Wow. Now, that's not to say everybody. Some people, their dry eyes get worse. And that's why we're very careful about people who have severe dry eyes. For somebody like you with mild dry with their contacts, it's a, it's a miracle. I mean, you'll, well, that- you'll wake up every day and you'll stop putting those drops in. You'll stop feeling your eyes tear up in the wind. It's great. Wow. See, I always said, I can't lose my eyes. You know, that's how everybody feels, right? I'm like, I, I, I'd lose, I'll lose my job if I can't use my eyes. And contacts correct me perfectly. So why would I get LASIK? What I didn't realize was contacts day after day, even the daily disposables like I wore, they actually can damage your eye. They can add to dry eye and, and they can do long-term damage that you should factor into your decision. Yes, and they can cause blood vessels to grow into your eye that shouldn't be there. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's issues with any way you correct your vision. So you say your goal is to have a world that's glasses and contacts free, that you actually think that's a reality. Do you think that's a reality like in our lifetime? Uh, I think we're really close. Like sort of the dream that motivates me as a surgeon is for me to be kind of walking through a museum with my grandchild someday and, and he pulls on my shirt and says what's that and it's it's a display case with eyeglasses and contact lenses in it. and he has no idea what it is wow you know, that that's that's sort of my dream and i i think it's amazingly close to reality so we've solved almost every problem with glasses and contacts except we don't yet have a perfect solution for the loss of reading vision that comes with age you mm. know where grandma and grandpa pull out their reading glasses in fact, it's not just grandma and grandpa, it's anybody over 45 generally needs reading glasses. And it's frustrating, you know, you, you see people holding things way out in front of them, trying to read it. And um, we haven't got a great solution for that. Usually we solve that by doing one eye more for distance vision, one eye more for reading vision. So the eyes kind of work together and let you read. That's that what doesn't I got. work for everyone. Yeah, exactly. So that's it's what perfect. I got. It, they call it monovision, right? Exactly. And it's perfect yeah. for somebody like you who's an on-air performer. You don't, I mean... You don't want to be grabbing, you know, granny glasses and putting them on in order to read something. It doesn't work. It's it's too much of a hassle. Well, it's funny because my up close reading was doing okay, but I know it's going to go in the wrong direction. Um, And my long distance vision was always the problem. So I put people out there who wear contacts, you'll understand this. I was wearing a minus three in each eye, minus 3.0. And um, I tried doing a minus three and a minus two. You figure out which one is your dominant eye. Your doctor does that with you. And your dominant eye, they correct for the long distance. So that stayed minus three. And then the weaker eye, I guess non-dominant, they'll they'll undercorrect that in the LASIK. So that's going to be your reading eye. And so I tried minus three and minus two, minus three and minus 
2.25, minus 3 and 2.225, and so on. And I wound up settling on minus 2.75 and minus 3. And I wore those contacts for months to see if I could read. Could I, and, and I love it. I, I was like, this one I can do. Yeah. And so kudos to, you know, kudos to your doctor, because that's what the kind of the LASIK mills don't do is you need a doctor in a system that will sit down with you and really figure out how your vision should be corrected and, and what's the right procedure for you. You know, LASIK's not for everyone. I mean, it's fantastic for people who are minus three, but not for people who are minus 12. Mm. And so, you know, you need a, a center that'll figure out what's right for you. For, mm-hmm. for the really near side appeal, we do something called the implantable contact lens. Yeah, what's and, that? Ah, yeah, oh, it's fantastic. It's a tiny little clear. It looks like your your old soft contact lenses, but about half the size. We roll it up in a little tube and insert it into the eye. It unrolls, but it just stays there, correcting vision permanently. What? And, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's Doesn't really. Doesn't that neat. cause dry, terrible dry eye? That. Yeah, no dry eyes. Yeah, that's a miracle. Yeah, yeah, it's really neat. And uh, the next generation of this was just FDA approved this week, actually. Wow. And so it's that's growing in popularity. That's um, for the people who who have very like minus twelve. You're saying? Well, actually, I, is it? It's been great for people with a lot less than minus twelve. Like oh. we're using it sometimes as low as minus four. It just oh, depends wow. on the individual. And okay. but my message is, you want a center that'll figure out what's the right thing for you because. Um, there's all saying that if every, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, mm-hmm. right? So you want a center that does a variety of procedures, got expertise in those. It'll sit down with you and, and spend time to figure out what's right for you. Well, I know that, you know, you've, you've taken care of every star in Hollywood. They all go to you. We've got video of you doing the Kardashians. I think you did Kylie Jenner. You did Kendall Jenner. You did Kim Jenner or Kim Kardashian, Chris Jenner, um, William Shatner, Cindy Crawford, Dennis Quaid. Uh, I could go on. Uh, the, the list is pretty impressive of, of the people who have trusted you. But finding the right doctor for, you know, the average Joe out there, they probably don't have access to you. They might not have access to a Dr. Mandava. So how do they find out, okay, this guy's legit. I can entrust my eyes to him or her. Yeah, well, um, 99.9% of people I correct are just regular people like, well, I was going to say like you and me, but that would be just like me, actually. Mm-hmm. And uh yeah, most of what we do is take care of school teachers and accountants and uh, other doctors. I mean, that's that's who we take care of. The um, there's a couple of things to look for in a in a in a surgeon. One is you want somebody who's very experienced. That's kind of obvious. You want somebody who will sit around and answer your question. You don't want to feel like you're getting a high pitched sales push. Uh, mm-hmm. You want people who are careful. You want people with good reviews. I mean, uh, and you should read the reviews. Find out not just how many good ones they have, but Look at the bad ones. Everybody gets bad reviews. See how they responded or even if they even did respond. Mm. Um, and they get referrals from your eye doctor because your eye doctor knows better than probably anyone who the best LASIK surgeons are. That's and so there's point. ways with a little bit of research, you can get great results like you've had. We're coming back with the good doctor right after this. All right, let's kick it off uh, with... Steve in Ohio. Steve, what's your question for Dr. Maloney? My question is, uh, first of all, I appreciate the segment and I've learned a lot. My qu- I actually have two quick questions. My first is, how common is it for somebody to get the procedure in one eye only, like my right eye, because my left eye is very close to perfect, far out and in close. And then my second, go ahead with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's... Uh... If it's not broke, we don't fix it. So uh, if one eye is good, we just do the other eye. So that's not that uncommon. Or sometimes we'll do just one eye for distance and leave the other eye for reading. Megan mentioned monovision just a little bit ago. Hmm. Right. Okay. What's part okay. two? And yeah, part two was um, I'm struggling with blood sugar that is higher than it should be. I'm, I'm working it down. I'm not on insulin. And so when going to my normal eye doctor, they realized that, when your blood sugars change your eye and your vision changes and they don't want to invest in new glasses yet until I get my sugars stabilized. Would you recommend the same stance about getting a LASIK procedure? Yeah. Kudos to them. That's uh, absolutely the right approach and uh, Mm -hmm. get your blood sugar under control and then worry about your vision. Look that it's real important for your health. So don't give up. Okay. Let's go. Let's hop on over to Jim in South Carolina. Who's got a question. Hi, Jim. 
Yeah, hi, Megan. Love the show, by the way. Thank uh, you. I, um, I had a question. I had cataract surgery last year, and they just put in clear lenses, and, I'm, and I am one of those people that really wants to see perfectly out of both eyes, and my right eye is still not great for distance. Can I, first of all, get the LASIK, and second of all, is it worth doing? Jim, you definitely can get the LASIK, assuming you're otherwise a good candidate. In fact, I did my mom's LASIK after her cataract surgery because she still had some astigmatism left over in both eyes. So I did LASIK on both eyes. She's had perfect vision now for seven, eight years. Yeah, that was my issue. They didn't correct the astigmatism. Yeah. So, yeah, it can work very well. Uh, You know, it just depends on the particulars of your case. Find a great LASIK surgeon and ask. So you can get LASIK after cataract surgery and you can get cataract surgery after LASIK. Sure can. Yeah. Okay. So, Megan, someday you'll get cataract surgery. Everyone, if you live long enough, gets a cataract, typically in your mid-70s. But it's mm-hmm. like gray hair. It's just a normal part of aging. So, yeah, uh, everyone gets it, even those who've had LASIK. Sometimes you see people, elderly people, get like, it's almost like a buildup on their eye. You can see like their eyes becoming like, almost, almost looks like a scab is on it. Is that a cataract? No, you can't really see cataracts. Cataracts are haziness of the natural lens inside the eye. So when you look out, your vision's foggy. It's just not clear, and it's very frustrating. And, and you re- fix that. Cataract surgery means you take your lens out, your natural lens, which is hazy, and put a new clear lens in its place. And uh, that's what Jim was talking about. And that works great, clears up the haze. That thing you see on the eyes of old people is what we call a pinguicula. It's like it's usually a little yellow spot kind of uh, just next to the colored part of the eye. Mm. It's caused by age and sun exposure, and it, it, they can be removed, actually, and, and they don't look very good. But good, because so I don't, I don't want that. I never go out in the sun because I'm so fair, but uh, it's good to know that's available. All right, Stacy in Wisconsin has a question for the good doc. Stace? Huge fan. Thank you guys so much for talking about this. Um, I have two questions, actually. One, I'm just wondering when we're looking for the right place or doctor, is there some kind of accreditation? Is it just the American Medical Association? Is there something we should be looking for that they have done training with that, you know, kind of shows they're they're good? (laughs) Yeah, that's such a great question. No, there's no accreditation, Stacey, for for LASIK surgeons. But there's some things that are sort of like accreditation. Look Look for people who are definitely board certified. Um, look for people who've published articles about LASIK. Generally, if you publish articles, you're probably an expert. And um, and again, get referrals from not just one person, but multiple people. And and the other thing is, here's another question. How do they make sure, Doc, that, that, that the guy has, or the gal, the most recent equipment? Like you made the point about the Wright Brothers flight. How do they make sure that it's the most recent laser? Great question. And one of the challenges is equipment. It's I've got about a million dollars of equipment in my in my operating room. And uh, so the temptation is not to buy more equipment. And so generally, um, places that do a high volume uh, will have the latest equipment because they can afford to reinvest in it. So that's a good reason to stay away from people who don't do a lot of LASIK. And then just ask them, what equipment are you using? And uh, they'll tell you. Mm -hmm. And then you obviously won't know, but then go online and Google it and see if it's the latest version. All right, last question. I'm going to steal this one. What's the average price of LASIK? A lot of people wonder that because it's not covered by insurance, is it? Not covered by insurance. Um, price of LASIK per eye ranges at a good place from about two thousand to thirty five hundred dollars. Um, you can get discount LASIK for a thousand twelve hundred, but usually that comes along with upcharges. So you end up paying around two thousand twenty five hundred by the time you're done anyway. All right, good to know. And thank you so much for the great information and the great calls, everybody. Thanks to everyone for the support on my own procedure. I'll be looking like this again on Monday and until I can get my eye makeup back on. In the meantime, don't miss Monday because my pal Jeremy Boring of The Daily Wire is here. He's the one fighting back with Ben against all this nonsense. You'll love him. See you then and have a great, great weekend.